Hello everyone, my name is Tamara Linkowski and I'd like to share with you what God has laid on my heart regarding um, the last chapter in the book of James. I think it's chapter 1 where it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God is this. Two things. Number one, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And number two, to keep the oneself unspotted from the world. I think I phrased it just about what it says in the Bible. Um, anyway, I just like to share with you my testimony on what God has done in my life and what I'm seeing God do in my children's lives regarding this verse. Um, the first one is um, caring for the visiting widows and orphans in their affliction. Now, what I what I would like to share, what, what the Lord laid on my heart, is this does not refer to just... Um, taking up an offering for, not that that's not a good thing. It is a good thing, and we need to be doing that, you know, but um, visiting is more than just paying for it. For example, my grandma is a widow, and she's 95 years old. Now, if I paid for her to attend a nursing home, I would be helping care for her, but I don't think that that's what the Bible would define as visiting her in her affliction, okay? Um, visiting someone in their affliction is being a partaker, sharing their burden, sacrificing for them. You know, that's just what I, when I read the Bible, that's what I see. I mean, when Jesus visited us in our affliction, did he just send money? You know, did he uh, send gold and silver to make us happy? No, he sent himself and he gave himself to the point of death. That's what, when, when I read visiting in their affliction, visiting widows and orphans in their affliction, that's what I get from the Bible. You know, whatever it costs me, I'm to lay down my life for this cause. And that's what pure religion and undefiled before God is. So anything else is defiled. <laughs> so it might be religion, but it's defiled and it's not honoring to God. You know, um, that that's the other thing that I read. You know, when I read the Bible, I try to read what it says and then what it doesn't say. Or what does the other part of it mean? For example, pure religion and undefiled before God is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. So then that would mean defiled religion before God is not visiting the widows and the orphans and their affliction. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to get at. So having my grandma here, um, it's been months now and it's been wonderful and it's been difficult. I'm not going to say that it's not, of course, our entire life changed. You know, I was giving my kids music lessons and that had to stop. And I was doing a lot of extra things and that had to stop because I want I know God has called me to do this. Um, God, the Lord made it clear to my husband and I, both of us, and I want to do it well. I don't want to do it halfway because I'm going to give an account to God. And so many days I sit there and I pray to God, Lord, I know my works today are just going to be burned because I did it, but I didn't do it with all my heart, you know, and I confess that before God. And then the next day is a new day. And so I pray not all my works are going to be burned caring for her, but, um, but I'm, I'm trying to follow God's word and God does bless his ways. We have to just obey first. And then he gives us understanding and he gives us blessing. My kids are learning so much about being kind and considerate and patient. And what does the Bible say about inviting people? What did Jesus say? He said, when you invite people to a feast, don't be like the heathen and invite those that can invite you back. You have your reward. But go out into the cities and invite the poor and the blind and the maimed. Invite all those, basically Jesus is saying, invite those that can never repay you. And then you'll have great reward in heaven. Now, how many of us do that, friend? These, these are all the things when I read God's word, it's like God just, every once in a while, this red light comes on like, oh, stop, read this you know, in depth. I want you to comprehend this. And that was one of the things that God used in my life. And that's part of why I cared for my grandma. Um, you know, uh, she can never repay me back. There's no money that can, you know, compare to caring for her. I mean, when you have someone who's a permanent infant, that's 95 years old, that can't do much of anything for themselves other than get up from the wheelchair and sit down in another chair, 
you know, it's, it's not easy, but I just love her so much. And I know that's what the Lord wants me to do. And so I'm doing it. And my kids help me, my older girls, um, even my younger girls, they'll run errands or get her something to drink or cut her up an orange or whatever. And they make my life so much easier. You know, it's a blessing to care for her and not a burden. If I had to do that's the other benefit of a big family. I mean, I had no idea that God was going to give me a big family. I'm so glad I didn't quit. I'm so glad I didn't quit at two kids because I guarantee you, if my girls didn't grow up helping me raise the other little ones, they would never be caring for their grandma and doing it joyfully. So you just learn selflessness. You learn sacrifice. You learn how to share. You learn how to take turns. You learn all these things in a big family that you never learn when you're just one kid or two. I mean, when you, everybody knows when you're the only child, the whole world revolves around you, but that's not how life works. When you grow up, you're in for a big shock because the world does not revolve around you. So when you're part of a big family, there's just so much work that needs to be done. The world can't revolve around you, you know. And so um, it's just such a blessing having my kids helping me. And, you know, um, and my little ones, the two little boys, they're so cute. They just entertain her all day long. They are her pride and joy. So that's the part of caring for uh, visiting the widows and their affliction. Now I want to talk about visiting the orphans and their affliction. We go to the abortion clinic every Friday, and honestly, um, it's very depressing. That's all I can say is it's very depressing. I've learned, though, oh, so many things. I could make an hour-long video about this. Um, you know, I was telling my daughter today, we go out there, and we don't just stand out there or sit in our cars and pray. We go out there, we sing, we have Bible tracts, we have those 180 DVDs, and we really try to minister and get people to change their mind. And God has shown us some of the fruit of our labor. I mean, we've seen women change their minds. We've seen women regret after having an abortion that probably will never have another one. You know, God does honor that. But what I told my daughter today, um, it's so true. I said, you know, Jen, it's one thing when we do devotions at home, in the privacy of our home, in the comfort of our home, worshiping God and being thankful for all he's given us and all he's done for us. And then you walk into the ghetto where you would probably never, ever go. And you're standing out there and it's not safe. And you're in front of this building that you know what's going on there. You know how ungodly it is. There's nothing you can do about it other than pray. And you're singing songs, worshiping the Lord. There is just something about that that I can't even explain to you. It it It's taken me and my whole family to a whole nother level of thankfulness that we never had before. Not that we weren't thankful, but it's almost like God opens your eyes even more so you can be even more thankful because I'm watching these women go in and, you know, I just sit there sometimes and I cry because they'll point their middle finger or they just ignore you. They don't know what they're doing or some of them do know what they're doing and are just rebelling. But I just thought, you know, that could be me and it would have been me. By God's grace, it's not me, you know, and when you know that you could stoop that low, you're able to minister better because you don't think you're better than them. The only reason I'm better is because I got Jesus in my heart. You know, it's not me that's better. It's the Jesus that's living in me that has made me better. And so, um, but the one thing, you know, I thought I was going out there trying to minister to these women to get them to change their minds. And instead, what God has done is use this experience of going every week to minister to me and my family. And I just can't even explain it like um, my kids, my boys, you know, so many people will not take a gospel track from me because I'm an adult or even my older girls because they look like adults. But my boys will go there and walk up to anybody and everybody. I don't think they've hardly ever been rejected. And, you know, when an adult who's walking into an abortion clinic sees a little kid giving them a 180 movie, showing them what a baby replica looks like of a baby that's 12 weeks and giving them those gospel tracts about abortion and the Bible and how Jesus saves, 
that really speaks to that adult. And not only that, my kids from a young age are learning to minister and we're doing it together. We're not going one of us here, one of us there. We're doing it together so it brings a closer bond to our family. You know, there, there's just so many blessings. The other thing is my my kids. It's like my my girls and my older boys. They just, they go there. They know what's going on. I've clearly explained to them what happens there. And they just, you know, one day they came to me and they said, Mom, thank you so much that you protect us from all of this. And that um, it just makes me even more not want to sin, want to save myself, save my first kiss for my wedding night. I don't, I don't want to end up here. And I know that if I sin, you know, hell is a bottomless pit. One sin leads to another. And I, I don't want to end up here. It's just made them stronger in their walk with God to desire to do right and to do good. You know, I don't, um, I, I don't push my kids. I want their heart. I don't want them to obey a bunch of rules that I've lorded over them. Um, for example, I don't believe in safe eyes and all that internet protection stuff. And I have eight little kids and my oldest is 15, okay? But I am very clear about what the Bible says. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. And, you know, the Bible says adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So if you lust, God says you're an adulterer, you know, if you lust and you're not married, you're a fornicator, whatever, you know, um, and, and I just tell my kids, that's you. So, you you know, I don't want my boys to grow up and have to tell their wives that mom put safe eyes on the computer to protect them. I want them to be able to say, you know what, my parents never put internet protection, but I just, I know it's wrong and I won't do it. You know, we got to learn to parent ourselves. There comes a point where we have to do that. And, um, and we can teach our kids from an early age to do that. That's, that's just my two cents. It might not be enough for you. If I was one who was addicted to pornography or something like that, I would just stay away from the computer, period, until the Lord delivers me. You know, um, maybe you need maybe you need safe eyes or whatever, but but I don't think it's something that we should permanently do because you know what? There is no safe eyes in the world. There's pornography all over us in the world, and we have to learn to of you know look the other way or look the person in the eyes with love without looking down at their chest. And, you know, we have to learn to ad adapt ourselves as Christians to be in the world, but not of the world. But I'm never going to safe eyes myself from the billboards that are there and all the things that are there. I just have to learn to ask God to really renew my heart and renew my spirit so that those desires leave me so that the only desire I have is for my husband and no one else. And when we're honest before God, I really believe the Lord does that. And before each other, before God and each other. You know, I'll just give you one quick example. I remember one time years ago, um, we were watching a movie. I don't even remember what the movie was. All I remember is that night I had a dream about the guy. And I, I promise you, I wasn't even thinking about him like that when I was watching the movie. I just remember thinking, oh, he's pretty good looking. And that's about it. And um, the next day, I... I, uh, after that dream, I told my husband and I prayed, I said, Lord, if this is how sick my mind is, my subconscious is, then I don't need to be watching movies, period. You know, I mean, that's one reason I don't care to work with other men because as, as much as I'd like to consider myself a godly woman, it's not a godly thing for me to be spending 40, 50 hours with someone of the opposite sex, probably more hours than I would be spending with my husband. How long can I do that for before something happens or I get tempted to sin or I lust or something? You know, it's just not healthy. That That's just my two cents. That's what I believe the Bible teaches. You know, women ought to be keepers at home. You know, if you're gone 40 hours a day, how can you keep your home. You're not there to keep it. You know, it's hard to keep a home when you're not there to keep it. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent, but that's, so I prayed and I said, Lord, I'll, I just won't even watch movies. I don't care. You know, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It's better to enter into heaven with one eye than two eyes that are going to ca be cast into hell. And so, um, so that's what I prayed. You know what God did for me? 
God did not just clean my conscience, but he cleaned my subconscious. And I still watch movies. But when I have dreams, they're all about my husband. Because I believe with all my heart, to the degree you desire to be sanctified, that's how much God is going to sanctify you. I believe that with all my heart. So that's my little... I don't even know why I talked about that, but I wanted to make this video about visiting widows and orphans in their affliction and keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. You know, that it's just all about that verse. I pray that God will use this to be a blessing in your life um, and to help you to desire to be pure and to be honest before God, because he already knows, <laughs> you know. And honest before each other, because the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. You know, so it can may, remain a secret for 20 years, but one day it's going to come out. And um, it'll help us to remain humble, to know, you know, I think one of the reasons people at the abortion clinic listen to us and don't, don't um, treat us like they treat some of the other people is because I think they know I never, ever speak to them in a condemnatory fashion I always tell them, you know, before I was a Christian, I would have walked right in there because I would have. That was me. <laughs> you know, God spared me from getting pregnant um, before I got married. But that was just that was just God, because I really believe had I got pregnant, that would have been the first place I would have went to. So the, it's the Lord that has to take the scales off people's eyes. But we have to do our part to be the messengers. But at the same time, our our message should be speaking the truth in love. You know, if I don't love those people that are walking in there, it's not going to do any good. I'll just be harping and yelling and screaming at them, you know. So anyway, God bless you. Thank you for watching. I pray this was a blessing.